Ich habe all diese großen Spieler, diese großen Spieler gesehen. I was Austria's leading football commentator for more than half a century, so I've seen all the great footballers in the flesh. Pele, Maradona, Best, Messi and Ronaldo. They were all great. But the greatest by far that I've seen is Matthias Sindelar. Most people haven't heard of him, but here in Austria, he is a legend. By far the greatest player that we have ever produced. That's not just because of what he did on the pitch, but because he took a stand off it. He was the first footballer to stand up to Hitler, and he paid for it with his life. I first saw him when I was just 10 years old, in 1931. That was when the Wunderteam, as we called them, was born. They beat the mighty Scotland 5-0. And even better, we thrashed Germany, our neighbours who, like all neighbours everywhere, imagined themselves to be our superiors. Twice. 6-0 in Germany and 5-0 in Vienna. I was at the game in Vienna and I still remember how we laughed at the Germans. Get back across the border, you imbeciles. Come back when you've learned how to play. It was the only time in my life that Austria, not Germany, not Italy, not England, not France, Holland, Spain or anyone else, but Austria, little Austria, were the best team in Europe. And at the heart of our team was our brilliant centre forward, Matthias Sindelar, who was known throughout Europe as the Paper Man. Mr. Sindelar, sir, would you mind telling our listeners around the United Kingdom how you came to be known by the name Paper Man? <laughs> well, it's because in Austria I'm always in the papers. <laughs> no. Well, seriously, it's because I'm so thin. They call me the paper man because it looks like I might just blow away in the wind. <laughs> There's been some talk that the biggest clubs in England, including champions Arsenal, would be interested in signing you. Would you ever be interested in playing in England and becoming our first ever foreign star? Well, that is very flattering, of course, because England is the home of football and I'm delighted to play here at Wembley with my national team. But I don't think I could ever play club football here. I'd miss Vienna far too much. I think it was the cafes that he would have missed most. Footballers were different then. They weren't the millionaires that they are now. Then, they still ate and drank with the fans. And no one ate or drank more than the great Cinderella. We all used to wonder how he could stay so thin. Perhaps it was because he worked off all the beer and bratwurst with his legion of female admirers. Come on, paper man. Let's see if you can slip through my defenses. But like everything else in Austria, that all changed when the Nazis invaded in 1938. And a hog! Of course. They didn't call it an invasion. They called it the Anschluss, or the annexing of Austria, so that it became part of a greater Germany. <laughs> Austrian football fans, especially young Austrian football fans like me, used to joke that the Nazis only did it because they wanted to get their hands on our players. 
annexing the likes of Sindelar, Smistik, Nausch, and the rest for a combined Germany team, with Hitler himself choosing Sindelar as his star striker, because he was allegedly Hitler's favourite footballer. Well, if that was true, they reckoned without Sindelar and his absolute abhorrence of Nazis. He'd always hated the Germans anyway, if only because they'd always been Austria's nearest and greatest rivals on the football pitch. But the Nazis were something else. And so, after the Anschluss, when the order inevitably came down from on high to purge the Austrian club teams, and especially the national team, of any Jewish elements, Sindelar led the protests. Carl, they can't be serious. Half the team is Jewish. Half the crowd is Jewish. As our captain, you have to do something. What the hell can I do? My wife is Jewish. They want me out of the team next. It was even claimed that Sindelar himself was Jewish. Or that his girlfriend at the time, a beautiful Italian woman called Camilla Castagnola, was. However... That rumour was probably started by the Gestapo themselves, who started a file on Sindelar and labelled him a social democrat and, even worse, a friend of the Jews. Personally, I'm not so sure that Sindelar was such a friend of the Jews. After all, he did buy one of his beloved cafes when the original owner, a Jew, was dispossessed. I always wanted my own cafe. I never imagined getting it like this. Don't worry. If you didn't buy it, someone else would have. And they would never have loved this place like you do. I suppose so. Come here. Why? So we can dance. But what was never in doubt was his love of Austria and the Austrian people. That was why he refused to play for the new combined Germany team, even if that meant missing the World Cup in France in the summer of 1938. And it was also why, in the so-called Alliance game of April 3rd, 1938, when Austria were allowed to play as an independent entity for the last time against their conquerors, or rather annexes, Germany. He did what he did. Once again, I was in the crowd that day and it pained me, as it did many others, to sing the German national anthem. But I did sing along, through gritted teeth, as there were German soldiers everywhere, watching us all for any signs of disobedience. We didn't have a choice, and it soon became clear that neither did the players. As our Wunder team, which was ageing anyway, but still too good for the mediocre Germans, went through the motions, passing it around at the back and making no attempt to find Sindelar or any of our other forwards. Rumours began to circulate in the crowd that they'd been ordered not to score. They haven't. Have they? They have. I can't believe the Germans would do that. After all, we're supposed to be compatriots now. Oh, you must be joking. You know the Nazis. They'll do anything to win. 
and when we missed some golden opportunities before the half-time break. Opportunities that Sindelar and the others would normally have taken in their sleep. We knew that the rumours must be true. God, you were right. Even Sindler's in their pocket. I don't know if Sindelar somehow heard the mutterings and accusations in the crowd when he walked off at halftime and was determined to prove them wrong, or whether he was just disgusted with his own first half performance. But whatever the reason, he played like an entirely different man in the second half. And when Sindelar began to play, the whole Wunder team began to play, as if it was 1931 again and Austria was once more a proud and independent country. It was as if they had remembered who they were. Austria, the Wunder team. And when they remembered, so did we. And then they scored, Sindelar himself firing home. And in all my years of watching football, I've never seen a crowd go so wild. And then they, we went even wilder when Austria scored a second goal, this time through Karl Sester, Sindelar's close friend and partner in attack. We were ecstatic. It was as if there was no Anschluss and no Hitler. Just the glory of the Wunder team and the glory of football itself. And what followed was even more extraordinary. To this day, I still can't believe that he did it. What's he doing? I think... Yes. He's dancing. He's dancing at once. He was dancing right in front of the VIP rostrum, which was full of Gestapo and other Nazi officers and literally covered in swastikas. And he was dancing, just as he danced through the German defence, a Viennese waltz. And as he danced, so did we, until pretty soon, almost all the crowd were up on their feet and dancing too. Austria didn't play again as an independent country until after the war, and Sindelar never played for them again. The Nazis saw to that. He had embarrassed them that day, and they swore revenge. It wasn't enough that they drove him out of football. Oh no. They had to destroy his cafe too putting the windows out and ruining his livelihood. Just as they had destroyed so many other Jewish businesses. And finally, they had to kill him. He hadn't played football in nearly a year, and he was certainly no longer a threat to the Nazis. Not really. 
despite sometimes trying to give impassioned interviews to his former friends in the press. But the Nazis didn't care. They were just determined. First, to get even with him. And secondly, to get rid of him. You see, the Nazis, in their fantastic hubris, thought that they could not only rule the actual world, but the football world too, despite the fact they only had an average team. That was why they sometimes challenged those they had vanquished to play against them, so that they could not only humiliate them militarily and politically, but in sporting terms too. It was ridiculous and absurd and small-minded, but that was the Nazis. And if you dared to give them a game, well, then you were doomed. Others would do so later in the war, like the great Dynamo Kiev team in Ukraine, who beat the Luftwaffe 11 when they were all lined up and shot. But Sindelar was the first. That was why he had to die. Officially, it was carbon monoxide poisoning from a faulty stove. But that didn't fool anyone. All of Austria knew that Sindelar had been gassed by the Nazis. In effect, becoming the first of so many millions to suffer that fate. Some people claim that he committed suicide, having left the gas on deliberately, that he no longer wanted to live if he couldn't play football. Well, either way, directly or indirectly, the Nazis were responsible for his death. But the most extraordinary thing of all was that he wasn't forgotten despite the Nazis' attempt to ban him from football and write him out of history. Instead, he received a state funeral in Vienna, and approximately 15,000 people came out onto the streets to pay their respects. And what was most amazing, indeed, it was almost unbelievable, was that his coffin was driven through the city. The old, familiar chant, which had first been heard on the terraces nearly ten years earlier, but had not been heard since that final game against Germany, began again. Slowly at first, but then with gathering intensity. Until finally... It became a deafening cry. It was the greatest thing I've ever seen as a football fan. And I wasn't even at a football match, but at a funeral. And I know for a fact that there were people in that crowd, mourners, or just those who stood silently on the street, heads bowed as the funeral cortege drove past, who went on to fight the Nazis, either joining the resistance when the war began, 
or fleeing the country and fighting with the Allied forces. I know that for certain, because my father was one of them. There was one thing, though, that always intrigued me about that day. One thing I could never work out. Why had the Nazis allowed it to happen? After all, they completely controlled Vienna by then. So why did they allow Sindelar, who had so publicly opposed their occupation, to be given a hero's burial, and thus become a martyr for Austrian independence, both on and off the football pitch? I only found out a few years ago, when Sindelar's best friend, who had also been the president of Austria-Vienna, the club that Sindelar had played for, revealed the truth about what happened to Sindelar after his death. The president had gone to the mayor of Vienna and asked that Sindelar be given a state funeral in honour of his unique sporting achievements and the unique bond he had with Austrian and especially Viennese fans. The mayor was eager to afford him that honour, but Nazi salutes, which by then had been introduced in Austria too, prevented there being a state funeral for anyone who had either been murdered or committed suicide. So the president and the mayor somehow found a sympathetic Nazi official. A Nazi, but a nice guy, as the president later described him, and persuaded him to register the death as being caused by an accident. Namely, the faulty stove. Now... It might just have been that the Nazis were simply keen to cover up their murder of Sindelar, and so happily agreed to give the official cause of death as an accident. However, the Nazis normally didn't care who knew what terrible things they'd done. Indeed, they boasted about them. So I like to think that the particular Nazi who signed Sindelar's death certificate did so because he had seen Sindelar play, perhaps even against the German team in the Alliance game, and was so impressed by his skill as a footballer that he doctored the papers to allow him to receive the send-off he deserved. If that was the case, and obviously we have no way of knowing for certain, then it just proves how great a player Sindelar was, that even the Nazis, who he hated and did so much to humiliate, were among his greatest fans.